So I'm joined with uh, Michael McPhee and Rob McLeod. The, Mike's the executive chairman and, and Rob is the CEO of IDM Mining. So boys, can you tell me everything that I need to know about IDM? In 30 seconds? You got us all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, IDM is, uh, it's actually been, it's my dream project. It's a, uh, a property that is very close to my heart, to my home community of Stewart, BC. Population? 500 right. right now, plus or minus, depending who's in town. Swells a little bit during the season when yeah. there's some mineral exploration going on. It's the, uh, it's the Red Mountain Project and uh, we believe it'll be uh, the next gold mine in British Columbia. Okay, so what is, tell me some of the details about Red Mountain. Um, we recently acquired a 100% interest in, in the project. It is a high grade, uh, underground, thick uh, gold deposit, uh, over 450,000 ounces of measured and indicated, plus some additional inferred. Uh, there's been over $40 million spent on the property mostly in the late 1990s. So there's a high grade resource that we believe has excellent potential for being a near term producer. But even more importantly, there is significant exploration upside on one of the largest hydrothermal and alteration systems in northwestern British Columbia, which is by far the richest area in the province okay. for gold. Okay, wait, is it, a, is it an exploration story or a mining story? Well, you know, that's, uh, Tommy, that's a big, Part of what this is, it actually appeals to I think all investors that are interested in the mining space. You have a uh, a very very high grade, low cost of production. We're, we're based on previous economic studies and confirmed by our own internal work. Um, we're looking at less than five hundred dollars an ounce uh, cost of production, um, eighty thousand ton, eighty thousand ounces approximately uh, of production a year. There's there's a so a current gold prices that's like. A $64 million profit potential per year. Yeah, and that's, yeah, I think conservatively, uh, yeah. that's what we're looking at. But but what I was saying is you have, and what, what Rob was talking about is that there's a there's a mine here, there's a, um, a project that could be BC's next high-grade underground gold mine. Um, it's simple, it's a simple mining technique that's used extensively all over the world, and particularly up in northern British Columbia. And then you've got that paired up with huge blue sky potential that I know Rob, Rob will talk about. Where you, so you have this duality of opportunity here where you've got an economic mine. We're intending to publish a revised economic assessment report uh, in the coming weeks. And it'll demonstrate that conclusively in a, in a very, very definitive manner. And then around that, which, which appeals to the, the upside. I mean, we're in a business where people buy into the idea of a dream. And what this is, is a dream underpinned by hard reality of, a, of an economic mind. And then around that, you have this upside that is extraordinary. And that's where things get really, really exciting. And it's, we think in our business, there's been far too many stories that are being pushed out there that are just dreams. And you know, you have to have dreams because that's part of what we do in our business. But, but what's missing sometimes, and it was a quote actually that came from Rob is, our business has been too much about you know, making metal or chasing metals or whatever, and, and they're starting to forget about the fact we actually have to make money. We, we want to see money returning back to our investors. We want to see companies that are making a profit. And so what we have here is this combination of, of an economic mine with significant economic or, and uh, exploration upside around it. And that creates, a, I think, an incredibly exciting story. But it's not just like exploration upside like I could say about my, you know, my grandmother's garden. It's no. it's no, no, it's, it's real in stuff. Yeah. It, it it's real. Um, you know, recent historic uh, assay results, drill results. You know, from from a lot of the work that was done in in the early '90s. I worked there straight after I finished my undergraduate degree in, in geology in 1993 and 1994 for uh, a producer called Lack Minerals. Right. And at the time, uh, lac was being uh, hotly pursued by a couple other uh, producers, uh, including they Barrick, sold to Barrick right? who eventually yeah. got them. Royal Oak put in a takeover bid, and part of their defense mechanism was to try and develop Red Mountain as quickly as possible. So there was a lot of money spent. There was a lot of great work, geological work that was done, and there's all these other targets that weren't drill tested at the time, because lac was like. The management was focused on drilling out the ore bodies. We've got to get this mine built. 
So what we plan on doing this summer is going back to a bunch of these other exploration targets and showing to the world that there's much more potential here than the existing uh, and we w believe economic resources. At, the at these project. targets, give me a feel for maybe some of the grades and the grab samples, or uh, like I, it's pretty staggering what kind of material you have up there. But uh, there's, help illustrate that. There, there's uh, there's a, w one of the key things if you look at, at great deposits around the world is you have a variety of different styles of gold mineralization on the property. It's a big system. It's a 14 square kilometer. It's a red mountain of and the, re uh, the redness is due to the oxidation of sulfides. There's showings all over the property. There's some, and my favorite is one called Macadam. Now this is a high grade, it's a little different than the, the main uh, resource area in that it's gold bearing quartz veins. And we had multi ounce samples up to 150 grams per ton that were collected out of several of these structures. Ounces we per ton. Grams per ton. No, so but there's, mul this, there's ounces yeah. per ton. Yes, yeah. and in an undrilled prospect. Now the most exciting about, thing about that target is when we were working down there in the early 90s, we were sitting right above a glacier. In the 20 years since, the ice has pulled back in the order of a couple kilometers directly to the south. Michael and I were just on site yesterday in this new exposed area of an unbelievable amount of sulfide mineralization that has never been sampled before in the same style as, uh, as the resource area, the Mark and AV zones, as well as these quartz veins. So this is all new unprospected country. And, and in Northwest BC, there is a uh, dis recent discovery history of new deposits found based on glacial, uh, glacial melt. And, and you know, one actual personal story is uh, my, uh, my uncle uh, Don McLeod was a, a well-known promoter, and still is, uh, from during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And he had a junior called uh, Newhawk, which was a big success in the late 80s and into the early 90s on the Bruce Jack property that Pridium currently owns. And uh, uh, they knew of the Valley of the King showing as a bunch of float with all this visible gold at the base of an ice sheet. Now, Silver Standard acquired Newhawk uh, during the, the last nuclear winter in the 90s uh, for the cash that was in the bank. And the property kind of got orphaned for about 10 years until uh, Silver Standard came back out, and later Predium, and all the ice was gone, and there's this gold all over the place. And it's the Valley of the King showing, which I think will be one of the richest mines in the world. Similarly, with the adjacent Seabridge project, also in northwest BC, the Mitchell zone has a similar history. Adjacent to an ice sheet, the ice is pulled way back. So there's this all, all of this new area of adjacent to known showings right next to the Cambria ice field of areas that we haven't sampled before. So there's, there's all this new exposure as well as all of these known prospects that hadn't been drilled before. So it's really is a target rich environment okay. that will be filled. So I, you know, and it's really interesting because I, Rob's the geologist and a very, very accomplished Guys had a lot of credit and discoveries to his name over over a very very successful career. I I kind of come at this from the the financing, mine development side, and and the social license side of how you actually get a project built, and and take take the discovery through through the development. And I'll tell you, just when we were at site yesterday or or a few weeks previous, and when you fly into this area, and if your your sort of listeners and audience can kind of imagine, you've got this valley where you can see all around it there's basically a ring it's like a ring on a bathtub or something that goes all the way around the top and and the ice has gone down hundreds and hundreds of feet so all this it's just barren 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 land where glaciers used to be and it's this is we're not talking about hundreds of years thousands of years even decades we're talking like in the last well i guess maybe a decade or 15 years or whatever all this sad. has happened and nobody's nobody's been on it nobody's been on it we we set the helicopter down yesterday and we had a couple of analysts with us and, and other investment folks and people that have participated in the company in the past. And we were showing them the property because it shows really, really well. So we, you know, you, you touch the helicopter down and, and you're you know, surrounded by this amazing country. They get, out of the, they get out of the helicopter, walk across, and there's this, like Rob's talking about, this big quartz boulder with pyrite and mineralization all over it. And it, it's right there. It's just like 10 steps from the... 10 steps from the helicopter. And, and so one of the analyst guys are going, oh, did you, what, did you place that there? So we just <laughs> happened to trip over it when we got out of the helicopter. And I said, you know what? 
his name was Dave, I said, Dave, walk in any direction, north, south, east, west, you pick the direction, and I guarantee you'll find dozens more of these. That's exactly what he did, and we just walked from Rock to Rock. And that's this new mineral train where it's, it's like a brand new discovery that nobody's even spent any time on. And I'll tell you, Rob's geological crew that was up there yesterday, they were like kids in a candy store. They were just running around with their rock hammer from thing to thing. And so, and none of that, had, really, Rob, I mean, most of that has not seen the light of day of public markets or... or well, well, uh, one of the biggest challenges for, for most exploration geologists, unless you have a big gold-bearing quartz vein sticking right out of the ground, is exposure. Is you have, um, you know, to deal with overburden and vegetation cover or snow lichen, you can't necessarily see the rocks. And this new exposed area is, uh, is remarkable because you're dealing with almost 100% exposure. And, and the previous operator, uh, uh, um, a, a, uh, another company called Banks Island, uh, they did some assessment work also in this area, just a couple of days. And they, they had one sample that ran 95 grams per ton in a new area, another channel sample that was like six meters of seven grams in marked zone style mineralization. So, you know, we do see the upside, but we, we don't see any reason why we should take a couple more years and do more exploration and say, well, maybe we're not in the heart of the area. We believe we have an economic resource there right now. Why don't we capture that? We plan on entering the environmental assessment process. We're finishing our, an economic study, our PEA, uh, in, uh, very shortly. Um, let's get a mine built up there, and we can always expand it. What is the process to get this mine permitted and built? How long is it going to take? When is it going to be making money? First, we have to um, publish the economic assessment report, and then the detail the engineering, the mine plan, all that scheduling, all that stuff. What's the power line going to cost? All that. So that's all being done right now. We're super well advanced. We're we're going to shut off the the lock the whole economic model down the next week or two. Uh, the numbers look really really encouraging. Um, We'll, we'll publish that. Coincident with that, we're going to enter into the formal permitting process in, in British Columbia. Now, um, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty experienced with that stuff. We know there's a series of steps. We've got environmental baseline studies going on. We've got community engagement, Aboriginal community engagement. All that stuff is taking place right now. So we have to take our time through that. And it, you can't rush it. You just got to follow the steps. And so we're doing that very sort of methodically and, and um, diligently. How long do you anticipate permitting to take? A little over a year. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. I mean, it's, uh, we're going to start the process in July. Um, the maximum amount of time it could take is 18 months. We think because the project is much smaller, it can, it can move a little bit quicker. But, you know, 18 months in the scheme of it's mining fast. Is, is fast. Yeah. And um, fortunately, a lot of the baseline and environmental work and, and uh, things that we need to know has already been done. So we're cataloging all that. We've got a weather station in place for doing all the things that you need to do. So if you think about the sequencing of events, you've got um, the publication of a, a preliminary economic assessment in July. You've got, we're meeting with our, the BC Environmental Assessment Office in the next week. So that it formally starts our permitting process. We've now got the timeline started. We will then move through the process of infill drilling and, and um, tightening up the resource in the underground that Rob might want to talk about a little bit because there's a lot of opportunity to improve economics through that. Um, and then by the end of this year, we're going to publish a feasibility study. And um, it'll be on the basis of that that we'll make a final investment decision to move forward. Everything looks really, really good right now. And then from that point onwards, it's completing permitting and then it's moving into development. Now, coincident with that, you've got all the exploration work that is then providing news to the marketplace of the upside potential, and that's all the blue sky I've talked about. But, but this, you know, the, the project's been shown to work before. Um, metal prices, uh, we're, we're gonna use, you know, sort of $1,200 gold prices. We're not gonna be aggressive. We don't, we don't believe in, we, we have a philosophy, we don't believe in trying to make a project work by inflating prices or hoping that they're gonna go somewhere. Start with a base case. We need sort of 30% plus internal rates of return, which we think will far and exceed. And where JDS comes in, JDS Energy and Mining is a is a private engineering, EP, what's referred to as an EPCM contractor, engineering, procurement, construction management operations. That's what we do. We have over 30 mining engineers on staff. We're basically, you know, in the old days, the mining, a lot of the mining houses would have big engineering groups, big engineering teams. Uh, you know, that would, that would design. And, and uh, it's difficult in a space in an exploration company to 
house all that expertise. So what we've done here is we've combined forces. I'm, a, I'm the chairman of this company, but I'm also a, 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 you know, a senior executive with, with JDS, and we've combined these groups of en exploration excellence with mine development expertise, particularly in northern logistics. I mean, most of the diamond mines that have been built in Canada, JDS has had a major role in them. Um, we've worked all over northern BC. We understand our logistics. We know how to deal with snow. We know how to handle um, road building and alpine terrain. I mean, that's what we do for a living, and we do it very, very well. We have over 250 employees, a very, very strong group based here in Kelowna and Vancouver, and um, mine building is what we do and mine operations. And that's that kind of combination of skill sets, I think, is a is a huge value added to this project, and company. we really believe in the project. So, um, construction timeline would be if you had a, a, a year or eighteen months for permitting, how long would be the construction yeah. phase? Be six, is that another six year? Six to or? nine months. Yeah. 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 So, uh, while you're doing the, the the permitting process for uh, for operations, there is still uh, a lot that you can do to advance the project towards right. the mine. So, we um, we're quite close to the community of Stewart. Uh, uh, it, it's the project is currently helicopter access, uh, but it would be like building a typical logging road that you see in British yeah. Columbia to get up to the project. So that's something that we could potentially do uh, next season, as well as underground development work as we go. There's the there, and it's one, tell me one thing to note is that and I wish your viewers could see this. Maybe we can show some photos or something. But there's you know there's an 1800 meter tunnel, you know big production size at it already drilled into the mountain, right? There's there's millions of dollars of mining equipment sitting up there right now. I mean, we were just up yesterday and the mechanics that's that's up there, I think, I don't know, if it, was he from Stewart? I yeah, think the old Stewart. gentleman. Yeah. And, you know, they got some decent sized scoop trams and, and uh, dozers and material up there and equipment up there that we're gonna put to use right away. It's already bought, it's there, it's at the mountain, it's it's ready to go and um, we're busy refurbishing it and it's it's held up pretty good. So just to finish that question, um, so then it's tw end of 2016 uh, potentially making money. Um, oh yeah, 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 within two years. That's, yeah. our, that's our timeline. Yeah. Okay, so how are you gonna pay for everything? On the expiration side, of course equ equity financing is is the way to go. Right now, these type of high-grade, underground, low capex projects, and we are um, we are targeting, uh, you know, sub hundred million uh, capex, significantly less, less than a hundred million. Less than 100, yeah. There is it is easier to raise money to build those type of projects than it on, honestly is to to do a, a two million dollar financing in this current market. There is a lot of different options there, whether it's debt financing, uh, whether it's streaming type arrangements. Private equity. Private or equity, or, or, or further uh, um, um, equity of our, or issuances of our, our shares. There's lots of different options uh, that we'll, uh, we'll pursue, and there's lots of different groups that are interested in financing these high-grade underground, low capex mines with quick rates of return, and of course, in a politically stable, uh, stable jurisdiction. Yeah, so. we anticipate, and you'll you'll see this in economics, but the payback is very, very fast, and um, is anticipated to be really, really quick. And so you've got that that whole thing sub one hundred million dollar capex, um, quick quick to cash flow, quick to payback, simple permitting, all these sort of things. So we can we can answer a lot of those concerns, and there, there's a lot of precedent on that. And our, our key focus for investors will be to minimize dilution as much as possible so that those sort of earnings per share numbers that we, we don't get enough of in our business will be as high as possible. And, um, and we'll be able to create cash flow, which will allow us to continue to build the company. And, and I think that's what hopefully people see, is that this is the beginning. I mean, we're only weeks old um, since the company we paid we raised uh, a little over three million dollars just recently. We we paid for the property. We gave a million dollars to the to the company that we we bought it from. Um, we you know we're funding our programs. We're we're getting our crews up there. All the money's going into the ground, um, and this is the beginning of something that that uh, I think people will be looking at for decades uh, here. Yeah, it's it's interesting. When I first started my career, uh, there's a saying that was going around in the early '90s, and you know I never did any fact checking on it. But at that time, there had been only two mines in Canada that went into production with over two million ounces of reserves at the time. Hemlo and SK Creek. 
so many mines around the world start out small and then they grow into bigger mines through exploration success. You find, thing, you find new zones, you find expanded zones at depth. Start smaller and scale up, um, I believe, is the, is the way that the industry should be heading instead of you know, Uber uh, projects oh. with, with multi-billion uh, capex, capex and lower grades and, and, and lower grades well, and, and, and it, slow payback. And it requires you know, investors to look at it a little bit differently because you know, I, uh, every investment, every mining project has risk, right? But I would much rather take the risk on a project of this size that has very clear economics that you can, you'll pay back your capital super fast, you'll build it up and you've got all this outside around it versus, because you, you think about capital, you talk a lot in our, build, in our business about capital creep or, or budget, you know, you hear a lot about blowouts. Well, if a, if a project has a $5 billion you know, capital costs, A, I'm not sure where they're going to get their money because um, it's, it's really hard, hard to get these days and, and always will be. And then secondly, if you get some pressure on that, on those feasibility estimates that might be in the engineering studies, think about what that does. I mean, it just, five billion going up by 10% is, you know, that's $500 million, right? We're, so we, we've, we believe small is beautiful in some respects. So you start with a high grade, small, very profitable gold mine, and then, you know, it can continue to grow because you've got a lot of gold around you. And that, I, I think, is a, it's a responsible way to go. I think it has a lot of credibility, and I think we have the team to do it, and people should see that. Just quickly, you've had some success in, in discovering product deposits and selling companies. Can you talk a little bit about your career in as short a time as possible? Yeah, sure. I've, I've uh, had the great pleasure of working with, with many wonderful exploration teams, and, you know, just like in and uh, you know, the, the Los Angeles Kings didn't just win the Stanley Cup because of, you know, Jonathan Quick or, or, or Dustin Brown. It's always teams that make discoveries. Um, dur during the 90s, I worked for a variety of majors and juniors making smaller discoveries, nothing too big, up until 2000 when I started to work with, uh, with an excellent team at Miramar Mining. And from 2000 to 2003, we had remarkable ex success at the Hope Bay project in, in the Canadian High Arctic. You know, there's zones where I, I uh, spotted the discovery holes, but it's always a team that, that contributes to those discoveries and I was fortunate to be part of them. That the company is part. subsequently sold. Miramar was sold for uh, over a billion to, uh, to Newmont uh, uh, quite a few years back. And now. then fast forward to the underworld and, and, experience. And then their, uh, my most recent and best success was, uh, was underworld resources where um, you know, it was an interesting discovery story. Um, uh, I formed Adrian with uh, Michael Williams, uh, or uh, Underworld with Adrian Fleming and, and Michael Williams, uh, with the, the plan of exploring down in New Zealand in, uh, in 2007. And um, I also had my, my company, which was, which was a big success at the time, called Full Metal Minerals, which was an exploration company up in Alaska. And uh, a uh, uh, prospector named Sean Ryan, met up with me at the PDAC uh, back in, in 2008. And he brought this fabulous looking massive soil anomaly uh, that was called the white gold property. And uh, to make a long story short, um, he thought there's too much stock out in, in, in full metal minerals. And I was like, I have to have this project. So I convinced Adrian Fleming to stop doing the work we're doing down in New Zealand. And let's pick up this project in the Yukon because trust me, it's got the big endowment, lots of historic plaster production, high grades, and a big soil anomaly. I believe there's a deposit there. In 2009, we made that discovery. And later in early 2010, we sold the, the company for $120 million to Kinross Gold. Fast, happened fast. Happened really quickly, and, and Kinross has been a big supporter uh, of mine to this day. Uh, Kinross owns a little under 10% in, in, uh, of IDM. Who, who are your other major shareholders? Um, we also, uh, uh, Lakeshore Gold is a major yeah. shareholder. Uh, of course, Seabridge, uh, they own a little over 10% uh, based on, um, uh, on uh, the, the transaction right. to acquire the Red Mountain project. And we're, uh, I believe, between 22 and 25% uh, institutionally held. Right. And uh, in management, owns a little under 10. Right. Um, if you don't mind, I, I know you've got a, a pretty... Uh, I wouldn't know if storied is the word, but you've been very involved in the, certainly the community of the mining business. Yeah, yeah. And well, I would tell our, our watchers a bit about your career. Thanks. Uh, appreciate it if you can. 
Sure, that, I, I appreciate the opportunity. And I, I will say that I met Rob, um, you know, another success that we, we jointly shared in where, where Rob and I first got to know each other was um, in the SilverQuest uh, resources, which local Vancouver company, um, we were both on the board there. I'd been there for a few years. Rob, Rob came on a little bit, little bit after me, but it was um, Randy Turner's the CEO there and a colleague of both of ours. And um, I guess it was a year and a half ago, something like that was bought out by New Gold. Um, I think it was 160 million, somewhere in that range, something like that. So we, we, uh, you know, we both were part of that success, and, and it was where Rob and I started to work together. So you're not right? virgins at this game. You know? No, we understand how it works. We know what it takes to. But you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to good science, good geology, and and good engineering. I mean, it's. The, it's not about promotional ability. I mean, you got to be able to tell your story, but you got to you got to be working with with uh, a solid um, uh, a solid underpinning. So, uh, in my story, I, I started out in the diamond business up in the Arctic and was part of discovery teams uh, that are mines that are now a decade or two decades later are now becoming uh, becoming quite real. Um, and I've worked all the way through operations in, in gold mining, diamond mining, and copper, uh, both North and South America. Um, and uh, with a number of really, really, really top-notch groups. My most recent, uh, I was the CEO of the Mining Association of BC for four years, where I led the industry association that represented all the producing mines and smelter operations in BC, and uh, have been, I was chairman of BCIT and chairman of our uh, uh, exploration association called AMBC, and I've been really engaged in in just the business of mining and also the social engagement side of it. Because I think we have a great story to tell. But I, I came to that honestly. I, I came to that through operations, through exploration, through discovery, understanding the value of what, what we produce as a business. And I, I really, really believe in it. And I'm excited to be here. And my most recent, uh, other than board positions and things, I was the CEO of a company called Curious Resources, which is part of the fabled Hunter Dickinson Group. Um, and I led the IPO of that, a very, very successful offering raised you know more than 100 million dollars over over a few years um, took the project through an assembly of a team and permitting and everything and uh, and just recently over the last number of months I was offered this position with JDS uh, and I'm really really excited to be part of mm -hmm. this group and uh, and so I you know my specialty is financing I've done copper offtake deals I've done you know lots of lots of debt financing a lot of things like that I, I understand what it takes to build a mine and um, and I think, so we, we create a pretty good complement mm -hmm. of, of skill sets and um, I think have really good reputations on the street here in Vancouver, and across the country and really around the world. So we're, I'm, ex I'm really excited to work with Rob and his team to try and get this thing up and running. Okay, so what's your valuation right now? Uh, we're uh, eight, nine million. Eight, eight or nine million, million market cap right now. Yeah. Just started though, you know, we just got going. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah. when you net out the cash, it uh, works out to uh, uh, just a little over ten dollars per ounce. And you know, you look at other pure companies with similar size resources. We believe maybe not as high quality, not as thick as the deposit that we have. Um, our trading generally double to to eight times what we're trading. So, so you know, that's that's often a multiple that some investors use. Uh, gold price per ounce, so we, we think we should see that increase as we right. get the story out. We live in Vancouver, and you know, I remember my first house I bought in East Vancouver at two hundred thousand, and sold it for a lot more a few years later. And that same house now is one point three million. Y you want to get in when it's two hundred thousand. You don't want to buy the house when it's one point four million. I mean, what, what we're doing now is this is the beginning of a story. This is beginning of the Vancouver housing market. I don't know whatever analogy you want to use, but. But you have a combination of really, really experienced people that are behind this, good money behind it, solid money, solid investors, good, I mean, we are, some of our major shareholders are, you know, Kinross and Sun Valley and others that, that Rob's talked about. Um, and we have an incredibly prospective district that we're in combined with a solid underpinning of a reserve that's defined with, with everything around it. So it's that, and that's what defines success. You look at the Ross Beatties of the world, the, Marco Days of the world, the HDI guys over the, over years. What has defined them as good teams, knowledge and the science base, uh, the ability to raise money and reach out to people and tell your story, and then the ability to actually have the track record of following through. And um, and we we've, we've done all that. And this is this is the next big win. And this is the one we're really really excited about. From the flip side, playing the devil's advocate, what do you think could get in your way 
and you know what what are you worried about what are some of the challenges this is a pretty straight ahead project you know there's always bugaboos or surprises that 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 can come at you and and what has been a, a challenge for other companies that have looked at developing Red Mountain is that the biggest challenge in that part of the world is the snow, is you get uh, some of the most snow in the world. In fact, the Stewart area held the world record back in the 70s for a while. So um, other companies have looked at trying to f get around the snow and avalanche paths that, that, uh, that would lead to Red Mountain by aerial tram lines, Another operator considered a seven kilometer long tunnel at $5,000 per meter. That's a $35 million tunnel at least. So uh, we think that the best way to get, get around is you, you, uh, you, you slow down during the, the uh, snowiest months of the year, December and January. You give the miners some time off, gives you time to plow the road, and you start back up again in February. So similar to to uh, um, a lot of uh, gold mines that are working in the tropics and you have the rainy season and you shut down, you do your maintenance. Uh, we think by, uh, by limiting a lot of the work that we do during the winters, we can avoid all those snow issues altogether. Just for the sake of time, yeah. give me the timeline again of what, what people can expect going forward from, from this day forward. So you, you've got PEA. PEA being released in the next few weeks. You've got initiated and permitting. You've got a very aggressive uh, surface exploration program going on through the summer with surface drilling starting, what do you think, late yeah. July, August? Yeah, late July, early August is when we should get the, the surface we're, drilling underway. We're going to start re under rehabilitating the underground workings that are already there. They've already been drilled, everything's there. And uh, later in August, we'll start our underground infill drilling, right? That's the stuff to. If you can imagine for your audience, you know, you've got a drill hole over here, you've got a drill hole over here, and what you do with resources is you average the grade across the spacing. What we're doing is we're putting some more in the middle just so we have a higher degree of confidence. So that's a pretty simplistic definition, Rob. Sure. Yeah. sure. It, it, well, one, one of the, the main reasons why we want, we want to do it, um, you know, from our internal studies, if we can boost up the first year's uh, average grade that we put through the mill and achieve quicker payback, we, we could quite dramatically boost the rate of return. We're only talking a couple of grams per ton. The average grade is sort of between eight and 10 grams. If we can put over 10 gram material through in the first year, the project really sings. So there's three zones that comprise the, the bulk of the resource area. There's one, the middle zone actually, and the lower zone uh, have quite wide space drill holes. And I remember from my, my, my time as a junior geologist, there's some spectacular drill holes with some beautiful visible gold and we're talking thick, sort of 20 to 40 meter thick areas that don't have any drilling around it. So all gold deposits have high grade chutes in them. So we want a better handle in that zone. Where's the higher grade area? Just to, when we go to our final uh, uh, feasibility study, we, we can incorporate that into our mine plan and get that highest grade material first, uh, speed up our payback and boost our overall rate of return. It was even something we considered, is this necessary or not? It's still, you know, we're very confident in, in, in the resource there. It's just, it's a refinement and optimization program. There are some inferred resources that we also would like to upgrade to indicated. And there's some, uh, some tails, higher grade tails that, uh, that we'd like to, to, uh, to step out and, and see if we can expand the deposit as well from underground. So you wanted to add to that? Well, just in, in terms of risk, you asked about, right? I yeah. mean, when you look at this and, as a board member and, and looking at the company, it, you know, there's always commodity risk, right? But we're, we're, it's all about how do you plan for and handle those risks. Commodity risk, we're not using aggressive metal prices in our economics. We're using ones that, that are sort of industry standard, sort of $1,200 an ounce. Gold's trading well over 1300 today. Um, we, uh, and we'll use conservative estimates for silver. And um, so really our, our biggest risk is making sure we stick to our timeline, the execution strategy that we have. But we have the people in place to, to stick to those timelines, to, to make sure that we execute in the times that we present um, to the marketplace. And so, you know, our, I think our biggest risk is really um, is making sure that our entire team is aligned in the direction that we're going, which I think we've done. And the second thing is just understanding that there are external risks in the world. 
but planning for them. And if you can do that, then you'll be okay. You know, I mean, you don't control government permitting. So in our planning, we'll use the maximum allowable time and we think we can do it faster. So we set out 18 months, we think we can do it faster. But you set out these things and it's all about being, re what I'd like to see, the headline I'd like to see in a, you know, in two years from now is, you know, uh, Red Mountain Mine brought in ahead of time under budget um, and expected to take higher grade um, uh, through the mill than was estimated. It's also about expectations. And that's, that it's, but it's not an unrealistic one, and it's one that I think we can do, and we'll, we're planning for, and that's that's really our intent. All right. Well, any last word? I'd like to add to that also that you know uh, the, the community consultation and, and First Nations engagement, of course, uh, for for any project in in BC, the the whole so social license aspect to any mining project is is as important as the economics. I know, being from from Stewart, the community, there's no uh, more pro mining, pro <laughs> pro development place on the planet. I think it's a mining town. I'm a third generation miner. Dozens of my buddies up there are underground miners that are working all over the world. The development of Red Mountain would be a tremendous boon to the community of Stewart. It's always been my dream to come back where my father was mayor uh, for many years to come back to Stewart in a meaningful way. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity. And as well as to include all Northerners, the, the First Nations were in the traditional territory of the Nishka. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they have a, a treaty. They've recently signed uh, some uh, agreements with other mining companies in the area. And we, we look forward to working to, with, uh, with all stakeholders to, to advance the project. Well, it sounds like you have a very exciting summer coming up and look forward to keeping in touch with the developments. And uh, thank you very much for joining me today. We Thanks, look sorry. forward to getting you on site, Tommy. Uh, I look forward to that myself. Right on. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, buddy.